Today, I'm going to be in our series in Philippians. We've been walking through the book of Philippians verse by verse, and we've been just diving in, taking the summer. We've had some guests and some pit stops, but also most of the fall, just to look at the book of Philippians. It's a New Testament book. It's a book that Paul the Apostle wrote, and he wrote it from jail, which we know that we believe that he was chained to a Roman guard, and he was more than likely verbally saying it out a little window that he had. He was speaking to one of his disciples, and they were jotting down what he was saying, and then they took it to the church of Philippi, and they got to read this letter from their apostle, from one of their leaders who founded the church right there in Philippi, and, and he's writing this from sitting in a jail cell. So today, as we're reading it, I want us, as we're looking at like six verses, I want you to be thinking through the lens of where he's at, what he's going through, and what he's saying to us as he's going through trials and pain and problems, chained to somebody, dictating a letter to a church. Uh, today, we're going to try to wrestle with this idea as we look at a few verses. We're going to try to wrestle with this idea. What do you do when problems come your way and you're dealing with problems that you didn't ask for, that you didn't want, that you're just dealing with? How do we deal and how do we handle when life isn't going the way that we want it to go? And by, just a show of hands, anybody in here never had a problem before in your life? If you raise your hand, I'm giving you the microphone and you're going to teach for the rest of the day. If you've never had a problem, you know what, dude, I got to be honest with you, I've never had one problem in my entire life, not an issue, not a challenge. Everything has been easy, peasy, Eskimo squeezy. I made that up. I don't even know that's real. <laughs> if that's you, well, then either you're living in a bubble or you're not actually a follower of Jesus because it seems to me that even Jesus himself dealt with trials and problems and all of his disciples and all of his Christians dealt with problems, dealt with pain, and somehow, some way, they had to learn how to work through the problems and the pain that they had. What if the problems and pain that we're experiencing is not God's punishment on us, but it's actually God refining us through the purpose that he has for us? Like, 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 I'm not here to say that God sends problems to you, but I do believe that God works all things out for good for those that love him. So when a problem or challenge or situation comes into our lives, instead of blaming God that we're walking through this, what if we learn what we need to learn as we walk through it to become the person that God is calling us to be on the other side of it? Like, like what if your life has such a big purpose what if your life has such a big mission? What if God needs to take you through some fire to purify the gold that's on the inside of you? Because if he doesn't, you won't be able to handle what he wants to do through you if he can't do that in you. And today, here's what I'm going to ask. What if instead of looking at our problems and we get mad at God, what if we, instead of trying to get God to fix our problems, what if we started following God in the midst of our problems? Like, instead of just saying, God, fix it, God, I'm going to choose to serve you in the midst of it. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to look at a few verses. Verse number 20 says this. For, and this is Paul writing from prison. Just remember that. I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I've been bold in the past. So, so Paul's here, and he's saying, Hey, I've followed Jesus, I've been bold, I've gone after him, and I pray that I never get ashamed of the gospel. I never cower down. When life is just causing pain and turmoil in me, I pray that I've got the guts to stand for the gospel, even when it's difficult to stand for the gospel. We live in a time in society in America where it is no longer popular to be a Christian. It is no longer convenient to be a Christian. It is no longer acceptable. People don't want people to be Christians because it directly attacks something on the inside of them that they do not want to deal with. I'm here to ask you, when we're at work, when we're with our friends, when we're going through life, are we willing to be bold and follow Jesus even if it costs us the things of this world? It's easier said than done. Because so often the reality is this, is we want to be popular and we want to be accepted. And I had to come to terms early in my faith. I cannot be popular with man and also be pleasing to God. I have to choose which one I am going to go after. And either it's going to be popularity with others or it's going to be popularity with God. And I have chosen to say, Jesus, even if it costs me everything, I will choose to follow you. And he says this, he goes on to say, 
and my life, I have trust that my life will bring honor to Christ. Check this out. Whether I live or I die. Say live, live. or die. die. Now, 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 this is really interesting. We're going to camp in here for a minute. And it finishes in verse 21. He says, for to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. We're going to dive into that in a second. But let's camp in right here. Notice Paul says, I don't really know if I'm going to live or if I'm going to die. Caesar is contemplating if he's going to kill Paul because he's sick of him causing issues with all these people becoming Christians in around Rome. So he's like, I got to deal with this guy named Paul. And, 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 and so Paul is not knowing if the next moment of his life will end or not because he's in prison, jail, chained to a guard. And, and so we find Paul struggling with, I don't know whether I'm going to live or if I'm going to die. Notice, it's so interesting to me, Paul didn't dictate what God had to do in his life. I wonder how many of us are going through our journey and we keep trying to dictate to God what he's supposed to do in our life. God, I want you to do this with me. God, I want you to do that with me. God, I want this. I want this relationship. I want this job. I want this much money. I want this comfort level. I want this. I want this. I want this. I want this. How many of us are forgetting if we are followers of Jesus? This isn't about what I want. This is about what he wants. Amen. And so Paul's telling us, listen, whether I live or whether I die, it is not up to me. It is up to him what happens to me. I think we've bought a lie in our Western American Christianity that God is in the business of keeping us entertained and happy and joy and like all like joy is a part of the gospel, but we want to chase feelings. God, does this feel good? But what if the journey God is taking you on doesn't require a good feeling on the journey because it's going to cost you something on the way? Like, do did, 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 did you think Paul felt good being chained to another man who probably didn't have deodorant on? Come on, somebody. Like that Roman guard, listen, I've been around some of you dudes when you forget to get deodorant on. You could raise the dead with the smell of that coming off of some people's armpits. You got a dude baking next to Paul in a cell, no good clean air, no clean water, probably very little light, no activities, not a great meal. Paul is sitting there chained, not just day one. This is months and months he's been in prison. He is stuck there chained to this guy, smelling this human being. This guy's probably not happy to be chained to Paul. And Paul is sitting there saying this, I don't set the terms for my life. God does. God wants me here. God's got me here. If this is his will, it's not, it really matters what my will is. And I think for some of us, we get caught up and we get confused and we say, God, but I think you want me to be happy. And I think happiness is a position that we can find ourselves in when we realize it's not about us being happy. It's about us following God's will. And we can make the most out of any situation if we choose to see it through the right perspective. But chasing feelings will disappoint you every single time. I've even heard it said like this. If you listen to your feelings, they're often the first thing to betray you. You listen to your feelings, like, I feel like doing this, I feel like doing that. They're often the first thing to betray you. And so you have Paul saying, listen, whether I live or die, I don't set the terms of my life. I let God tell me what he wants to do in my life. I, I, I even know on my own journey, not even close to Paul's, not even, not even an ounce close to it, but I was a youth pastor when I became a Christian. I went to Bible college. I ended up becoming a youth pastor, and, and I meet my, my wife, Stephanie, who was singing up here today. And, um, and, and I meet her, and, I, and you know, I'm smitten over her, and I'm trying to impress her, and I'm doing all the things that she doesn't like, but I think she likes to get her to like me. And it's just, you know, it's a weird cycle of what men and women do. You know, it's our weird mating rituals. And uh, I'm like a peacock, and she's like, I'm not into this. <laughs> Uh, but the truth is, eventually, I, I, I convinced her somehow through the power of God uh, intervening that she would say yes to me. And, and, and so we, we, we get married, and, and now this is when two become one, right? Like, we become, like, uh, this couple, and, and part of our journey was we are going to join our finances. Some couples don't. I'm not here to tell you pro or con, but we decided to join one account, put everything together. She worked some, uh, she had, like, a job, and I was working at the church, and we come together. And she says to me, well, how do you tithe? And if you don't know what tithe is, tithe is when you give 10% of your resources, your money, back to the Lord. Malachi says, give the storehouse your tithe, and he'll open up a window of blessing to you, and it's this great, powerful scripture. And God even challenges us to say, you rob me when you don't give me a tithe. And it's an intense Malachi 3. I'd encourage you to read it sometime this week. And, and, and I grew up 
in a very poverty mindset, okay? I grew up um, not having enough money. When you got money, you spend it immediately. You, you live kind of poor and just this whole mindset of like you never have enough. And, and, and it, always, it went all the way back to my great-grandparents being West Virginia poor people in the dirt. And, the, and it just kind of gathered from one to the next to the next generation. You know, I, I believe Jesus can be in our hearts, but grandpa's still in our bones. Can I get an Amen. Like, that's real. We got to work through some of that stuff, right? Jesus is in my heart, but grandpa's in my, in my bones. And, and so I was carrying generational poverty of just fear. Now, my wife, she grew up in a home that made probably as much money as we did. It wasn't very different. And, but her parents uh, and her grandparents were people of faith, and they, they gave, and they were tithers. From, and she grew up in this culture of we trust the Lord. No matter what the external looks like, we trust God. And so we have me who doesn't trust God with money because I never have enough. And we have my wife who doesn't care what the bank account says. This is what God says. And we get married. And then it's like she asked me how I tithe. And I start saying a lot of words that don't make sense, but I'm just saying words. What happened was is I, uh, you know, um, I, you know I, I, I give a lot of extra time and, like, I serve. And, like, I, you know, I helped a kitten one time off a tree and, like, you know, like, and she's looking at me, and she's like, I, like, how do you tithe your 10%? Why are you saying all these things? I'm like, I, I don't know exactly. You know, I, I, I catch up. And I, I do it sometimes. And, and I can just feel myself drowning in this moment. And she said to me very kindly, not mean, but she just said, I, I just need you to know, like, I believe in biblical tithing. And I, and I thought that you do as well. And I go, what well, I do, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't practice it. And, and she just said, I just feel like our marriage needs to follow God's way. And would you just trust that we could do this? And I'll never forget the fear I had. But thank God for a praying wife who was like, hey, we're going to get through this together. And I had to get to a place, and I'm getting back to the scripture, that I needed to decide, God, this isn't about me setting terms with you any longer. What is yours is yours, and I need to trust you with what you've given me. And if your word declares a thing, I need to follow you instead of following my own ways, because my own ways lead to my death, but your ways lead to life and life to the fullest. So, God, I'm done not trusting you. Let me, in this area, as hard as it is, trust you even though it is difficult. I'm done setting terms on what can happen in my life. Amen. Verse 22. But if I live, remember Paul says, whether I live or die is up to Jesus. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I don't know which is better. Listen to this, verse 23. I am torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sake, it is better if I continue to live. This is one of the champions of our faith. This is a person who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He is in a jail cell, suffering, chained to a guard, dictating this, and contemplating whether he should die or live. And he's literally saying, I am torn between these two things. I don't know if you've ever felt conflicted or torn or feeling like you don't know which way to go. Paul is saying, for me, it would be better if I could just go and live with Jesus. If you have read your Bible and you are a follower of Jesus, you see that the Bible teaches that God will give us a new body in heaven. He will walk us on streets of gold. There will be no suffering, no sickness, no pain. He'll wipe every tear from our eyes. If you're a believer in Jesus, you ought to want to go home to heaven for eternity instead of dealing with the crap we keep dealing with here on this planet. Amen. Now, before we become like some suicide call, everybody just take a breath. <laughs> yeah! There's Kool-Aid. No, I'm kidding. All right, that's all right. Delete that off the podcast. Too far. Hashtag inappropriate. But the reality is, if we believed this, we would have a longing to go home, right? We would want that. And Paul is wrestling with this. He's saying, dude, I just want to go home because I have suffered enough. And Paul is broken. And I think some of us, we can find ourselves in a very similar space. We're asking God to fix our problem instead of show up in the midst of our problem. We're like, God, just take me away from this. Just get this out of my life. Just fix this. Just do this. Just show up in this way. And, and we're dictating to God what we want him to do. And 
Maybe God wants to do something in our problem instead of just taking us out of our problem. Maybe what God needs to do in us to get us to what we're supposed to be for the mission that God's called us in our life is walking through this trial, getting through this persecution, getting past this point. And what happens is us, the character is developed, the perseverance grows, and we are people who can handle anything that comes our way, knowing my God is able, my God is, has it. I don't need to lean on my own understanding. I lean on him. And Paul is saying, man, I'm torn between two desires. I long to go home and be with Jesus, but at the same time, I know it's better if I can stay here with you. It's hard when you don't know which way to go in life. It's hard when you don't know which way to move. It's interesting. Um, I, uh, my eight-year-old just celebrated his birthday. My wife is so great at, at the birthday time. She sets up everything, and, and she does for every year you're born, every year you're old, she does a card for you, like one, two, three, four, five. He got eight cards that she drew, she put something on there that we get to do as a family, like like you can stay up late. You could have, we can do this. We can go on a trip. We can do, and, and they get to redeem these cards, like coupons. We're teaching our kids to be extreme couponers someday when they get older, right? They're like, give me a coupon, right? And, and so she sets them all up, and they read them, and it's fun. And one of them she did this year for my poor 8-year-old, my Parker James, it was he opened up and says, you can either, she gave him options in it, which was the worst thing you ever do to an 8-year-old. You can either have a bonfire one night or uh, with s'mores, or we can do a movie night with popcorn. And that or word really bothered him. For two days, he labored with this card. He would read it at night when he was going to bed. He'd ask everyone their opinion on what he should do with this card. He kept saying, should I do why? Should, and what about this and this? And, 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 and it was making me to a point where I'm like, buddy, you just got to make a choice here. At some point, you've got to, you've got to do it, man. You got to pee or get off the pot. Come on, dude. You got to do this thing. And, 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 and he's just like, I don't know which one to do. And I'm like, blame your mother for all of this. Don't blame me for any of it. <laughs> Stephanie. <laughs> But the reality is he didn't know which way to go. And I wonder how many of us are in our life and we just feel like that eight-year-old holding that card. And we're just going, God, I don't know which way to go. I, I want to do this, but then I at the same time want to do this. I, I want to pursue some selfish things, but then I also feel you calling me this way. But what you're calling me to feels so much harder than what I want to do. And God, I don't know where to go. And we feel conflicted. Paul felt conflicted in this moment. I want to die, but I know I should live. But here's where he found his why to live. Verse 25 says this, but knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive. He actually was prophetically speaking that he did not believe Caesar was going to kill him, which was true. I, knowing this, I will remain alive so I can continue to help you grow. Why am I here? It's to grow and to experience joy of your faith. And when I come to see you again, you will have even more re reason to take pride in Jesus Christ because of what he is doing through me. Paul found his why, and it wasn't selfish. Paul found his why, and it wasn't to please himself. It wasn't to get him out of his pain. It wasn't to get him out of his problem. The why that he found was in, I am here to help you grow. I'm here for you to experience the joy that God can do anything, even in the problems you're facing right now. Church, if you're a follower of Jesus today, I believe personally that you are on this planet because Jesus wants you to be the light around the darkness that you walk through every single day. You're here to shine a light where others are in darkness. You're here to make a fire when others are cold. You're here to set the temperature of a room saying, because I'm here, God is here with me because he dwells on the inside of me. And so now I'm not anywhere by accident. I'm not anywhere by coincidence. I'm here because God appointed me to be here in this moment, not by coincidence, not by accident. And here's the truth, so that I can help others know a God in the universe who loves them, who hasn't abandoned them, who is for them, and to bring joy in every circumstance I face. God, I'm here on purpose with a purpose because I'm here with you. Paul found a why that was stronger than just his circumstances. Paul found a why greater than being stuck in prison. 
Paul's why was so that I can help you know him. That I can point you to a God who loves you. And that there's purpose behind the pain. God is with you even if it doesn't feel like it. And that you can experience joy of a salvation of a God who hasn't left you, but is right there with you. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray, Lord, for every single person. God, you're able to do something supernatural in our lives. And so, God, I ask you right now to do supernatural things in every person's life. Every person wrestling with a problem, every person that feels like they just want to run from the pain that they're going through, God, let us stand like the Apostle Paul, even when we're torn, even when we're tired, even when we feel like we don't have enough. God, would you be our strength when we don't have enough strength? Would you remind us the why? Why are we doing this? Why are we here? God, we need you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do me a favor. Would you stand to your feet with me? Stand your feet with me all over the room. Hey, I want to go back to worship, and I want to worship Jesus in this moment. But I just want to encourage you. I'm not just preaching to you this concept of the Apostle Paul as we walk through Philippians. Steph and I, there you are, hey baby. We've been walking through our pain. We've been walking through trials. This has probably been the hardest season of our life the last three or four months we've ever walked through as a couple. Not us personally, but things that we're just dealing with. Drama, pain, people just being people. And I just want to encourage you. My response to that will never be gossip, slander, or needing to fight my own battles. I don't fight my own battles. I let him fight my battles. And I'm here believing God that the best is yet to come. That his church is going to rise. People are going to get saved. And he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And so my choice today is to worship. My choice today is to stand. And my choice today is to remind my flesh, take a grip with your tired hands and stand strong with your shaky leg because your God is able to do more than you could ever hope or imagine. And so my response is to worship him. Amen. So I just want to encourage you. This isn't just some talk. I'm living out the very thing that I'm standing on right now. Jesus, you're able in the midst of my problems, to show up in Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing and let's worship and let's thank God for his goodness. Come on, church. Let's press into the presence of God. Let's do it.